Welcome to today's back to school webinar for parents and guardians of students with type 1 diabetes. My name is Andrea Kramer. I am an attorney at Cohen Kramer Law LLC in Massachusetts, a mother of an 11 year old who has type 1 diabetes and was diagnosed at age three. And I am also a member of the ADA Safe at School Working Group and the ADA's New England Local Regional Council. I will be co-presenting today's webinar with Jessica McKinney, Senior Manager of the ADA's Advocacy Group. Jessica is also, also has a child with T1D who is now 23 and was diagnosed at age 15. As parents of children with T1D, Jesse and I deeply understand the challenges of preparing for back to school and are both passionate about sharing our knowledge and experience and all the incredible resources the ADA has to offer with other parents like you. Tonight's webinar will provide an overview of safe at school principles and strategies, discuss legal protections for students with diabetes, the importance of written diabetes plans, the ADA's free safe at school resources, and opportunities that will be offered later this summer. Please type your questions in the chat as we go along. We will answer as many questions as possible after our presentation. We hope that you find this information useful and we thank you for joining us today. Next slide, please. This session is being recorded by the American Diabetes Association and will be made available online for public access and viewing. This means that questions and comments types, typed into the chat will be part of that recording. Next slide, please. While the American Diabetes Association attempts to ensure that all information is accurate and current, this general information about potential legal protections and medical best practices is not a substitute for individualized legal or other expert advice and assistance. The American Diabetes Association its staff and volunteers do not provide legal or medical advice or represent you. For legal advice or representation, please contact and consult an independent attorney. And for healthcare consultation advice, please consult with your professional healthcare provider. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As many of you know, the ADA's mission is to prevent and cure diabetes and improve the lives of all people affected by diabetes. The ADA delivers this mission through research, information and support, advocacy and public awareness. Tonight's presentation will focus on advocacy and specifically how to keep students with diabetes safe at school from the childcare setting all the way through high school and college. So with that, I'll turn the next section on safe at school principles and strategies to Jesse. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. ADA Safe at School campaign is based on three principles regarding diabetes management in school. All school staff members need to have a basic knowledge of diabetes and, and know who to contact for help. At a minimum, everyone who has custodial responsibility for your child should understand diabetes and how to recognize a low and how to get help. The school nurse is the pr primary provider of diabetes care but other school personnel must be trained to perform care tasks when the school nurse is not present. These tasks include insulin and glucagon administration, blood glucose monitoring, carb counting, and recognition and treatment of highs and lows. Students should be, be, should be permitted to provide self-care whenever they are at school or school-related activities. This applies to students who, are, who possess the maturity and skill set to do so. Next slide, please. As you can see by this list, there are a number of organizations that put their faith in the goals and principles laid out by the Safe at School campaign. These goals and principles help foster a safe environment for students with diabetes at school. Next slide, please. Here's what we know. Diabetes requires 24 seven management and students can never take a break. Parents should work with their child's school to ensure smooth coordination of diabetes management between home and school. However, recognize that home and school are very different settings. You, may, you might change your child's pump infusion site at home, but staff might elect to use a backup plan of insulin pins in the case of a pump malfunction. You might be able to make treatment decisions based on CGM data at home, and while the staff should still use CGM data, they cannot be expected to respond to every single data point. Parents and guardians need to make sure the school has all the supplies needed to care for their child. Fluctuating and out of range blood glucose levels may negatively impact learning and behavior. 
Parents and guardians should make sure written care plans, including the diabetes medical management plan, are developed before school begins or before your child returns to school once diagnosed. Next slide, please. We know it's important for students to have their diabetes management needs met to keep them safe and healthy. Schools must provide a medically safe environment for students with diabetes. Students with diabetes must have the same access to educational opportunities and school-related activities as their peers. Schools must work with the parent or guardian and the student to reasonably support daily di diabetes management activities. Next slide, please. Parents and guardians of students with diabetes have some extra preparation to do. Please approach the school in the spirit of cooperation and partnership and work cooperatively, cooperative, cooperatively with their staff. Be realistic, we're all only human, and please remember to be reasonable, as all perspectives must be respected and considered. Listen to the school's concerns and be ready to brainstorm to come up with practical solutions. For example, while a school nurse and or trained non-clinical staff should monitor and respond to CGM alerts, they cannot monitor and respond to every trend arrow like parents are able to do at home. Communicate early and often with personnel who will be in direct contact with your child. Be your child's advocate, but, but maintain an open mind and willingness to listen to others' concerns. Provide a complete kit of current clearly labeled supplies with snacks, including complex carbohydrates like peanut butter and crackers, um, and a fact act, fast acting form of carbohydrates like juice or glucose tablets. Encourage your child to wear a form of medical identification in case of an emergency. And keep the lines of communication open and provide the information that the nurse needs to make accommodations in the care plan. Build trust so you can bring concerns to the attention of the nurse and be willing to be a part of the solution. Next slide, please. So next we're gonna talk about discrimination in the school setting. Discrimination occurs in the school setting when a child cannot safely access or participate in school or a school-sponsored activity, including field trips and school-sponsored sports or other extracurricular activities. So what might discrimination look like in the school setting? Um, it could look like requiring parents to come to school or child care center to give insulin or provide other diabetes care, um, children being refused enrollment by a ch child care provider, schools or child care with a nurse or trained non-clinical school staff members, children being told that they cannot go on field trips or participate in other activities unless a parent comes along with them, student athletes not being able to safely participate in school sports and other after-school activities because the school refuses to provide a nurse or trained coaches or other staff, uh, students who are denied smartphone access to manage diabetes in the school setting, uh, students who are denied the opportunity to take an exam at an alternate time if they have low or high blood sugar. Uh, these are just a few examples of what might constitute discrimination, but are the situations the ADA most frequently hears about from parents. Many of these situations have also been addressed in lawsuits in federal or state courts or in settlement agreements between the Department of Justice and schools, camps, or child care centers. Um, next slide, please. Um, now we're going to turn to our first case study and poll. Um, we want to encourage some interactive participation with everyone here. Um, so our first fact pattern involves Devin. She's six years old. Uh, Devin's parents were told by the school district nurse that Devin would only receive diabetes care one morning a week when a school nurse was on site. Devin's parents would be required to come to school to provide care when a school nurse was not on campus. Does the school's refusal to provide care and to require the parents to come to school to provide care constitute discrimination? Give everyone a second to answer that.
Jesse, can you see anyone's responses? I can. So far, 22 oh, there we go. people have said, uh, 22 people have said yes, and four people have said it depends. Great. Um, so in most cases, this would constitute discrimination unless an exception applies under one of the federal laws requiring a parent to come to school to provide care, especially for a child who's six years old and is very unlikely to be independent, um, would constitute discrimination. There are many cases nationwide that support the position that schools must provide a nurse or other trained staff to provide diabetes care, such as the administration of insulin and glucagon. And if you're in a state of like Massachusetts that prohibits nurses from delegating the administration of insulin or glucagon, then there must be a nurse in the building at all times. There's um, many cases out there that have held that it's simply not reasonable for schools to call 911 in the event of a serious low blood sugar and hope they arrive in time. Next slide, please. So next, we're going to talk about the legal protections for students who have diabetes. In addition to listening to this presentation, we encourage you to go to the ADA's website at diabetes.org slash safe at school to read more about the legal protections to keep students with diabetes safe at school. Being familiar with these laws and how they apply to children with diabetes in the school setting will empower you to educate others and to advocate as needed to ensure that your child is safe at school and has equal access to school and school-sponsored activities. Next slide, please. There are three federal laws that protect students with diabetes in, this, in the school setting. The first is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is also referred to as the ADA. Um, second, there is the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, also referred to as Section 504. And as we'll discuss later, this is the law that 504 plans fall under. Uh, third, we have the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, which you may hear referred to as the IDEA or IDEA. People use both terms, but it's the same law that they're referring to. And this is the law that IEPs fall under. As we will discuss in more detail in the next few slides, all three of these laws require that students with diabetes receive the care they need to safely access and participate in school and school-sponsored activities. There are also many state laws, regulations, and guidelines that protect children with diabetes at the school setting. For example, many states have nurse practices acts that apply to the administration medications such as insulin and glucagon, other states have laws relating to accommodations or training or best practices guides for schools and parents to follow. At the end of the day, though, it's really important to keep in mind that federal law preempts state law, which means that if there is a conflict between the federal law and the state law, the federal law will, will prevail um, and protect the student with diabetes. As parents, we often feel as though schools have the upper hand when it comes to making decisions about diabetes management in the school setting. However, knowing the state and federal laws that apply to students with diabetes can help you level the playing field by empowering you to educate the school staff about your child's needs and the law to ensure a safe and healthy school environment where your child can thrive. Next slide, please. Uh, the first law we are going to talk about in a little bit more detail is the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so who does the ADA apply to? There are two sections of the ADA that are important for parents of students with diabetes to know about. Um, first, there is Title II of the ADA, which applies to state and local government entities, such as public schools. Um, next, there is the Title III of the ADA, which applies to places of public accommodation. Places of public accommodation are defined in their, under the ADA as privately operated businesses that are open to the public. There are 12 categories of places of public accommodation, including places of education and places of recreation, which encompasses privately owned daycare centers, camps, and private schools. Um, religious entities are generally exempt from the ADA's protection. However, religious entities may still choose to comply with the ADA to be more inclusive and supportive of students with diabetes and other disabilities. Next slide, please. 
So what is the purpose of the ADA? The ADA prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability. Disability is defined under the ADA as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. Diabetes qualifies as a disability under the ADA because it is a physical impairment that substantially limits a number of major life activities, especially endocrine function. But it may also limit eating, walking, talking, or performing manual tasks. The ADA requires entities to make modifications, also known as accommodations, to policies, practices, or procedures to ensure that the person with a disability has equal access to the programs, services, and activities being offered. Over the years, the Department of Justice has enforced the ADA against several child care centers to protect children with diabetes based on reports made by, by families to the DOJ. Such decisions support the position that a school, child care center, or camp cannot reflexively decline to accept a student because the child has diabetes or say they cannot administer insulin or glucagon. Under the ADAs, these entities must explore whether they can take the steps to reasonably accommodate the child's needs by modifying their policies, practices, and procedures. Next slide, please. So next we're gonna talk about Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Uh, Section 504 applies to public and private schools receiving federal funds including religious operated schools receiving federal funds. Um, the key here is whether the school receives federal funds, such as grants under Title I or Part B of the IDEA. Uh, Section 504 also applies to child care providers who are receiving federal funds. The rules for Section 504 are very similar to the ADA. That is, the school or child care center must explore what modifications or accommodations they can make to policies, practices, or procedures to meet the student's needs. If Section 504 applies, a 504 plan is then developed. Uh, as Jesse will discuss more when we discuss school plans, the 504 plan outlines accommodations, such as allowing a student with diabetes to eat at a regularly scheduled snack or lunch each day, eat or drink fast-acting carbs at any time to treat a low blood sugar, carry testing supplies or a CGM, or have a nurse or trained diabetes staff accompany the student on a field trip or school-sponsored extracurricular activity. Um, it's important to keep in mind that accommodations under Section 504 are individualized and there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Next slide, please. Next, we're gonna talk a little more about the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or the IDEA. The IDEA is a special education law. It does not apply to all students with disabilities. To qualify, a student with diabetes must demonstrate that diabetes or another disability adversely impacts their ability to learn and to make effective progress academically. If a child qualifies under the IDEA, an individual education plan, also known as an IEP, is developed by the student's IEP team, which often includes a general educator, special educator, parents, guardians, and other staff or outside providers familiar with the student's needs. In most states, if a child has an IEP, and any accommodations typically included in a 504 plan will be outlined in that IEP and a separate 504 plan is not needed. Um, this is something that um, that I personally have dealt with. My son has an IEP in Massachusetts, and what we typically do is we add a line in the additional information section of the IEP that states that his doctor's orders, diabetes care plans, and accommodations um, are, that are all on file in the nurse's office are incorporated by reference into the IEP. And then we update those plans separately with the nurse um, and any necessary administrators at the start of every school year. And we found this really helpful because sometimes that annual IEP meeting does not align with the start of the school year. And when you get your new doctor's orders and might need to update um, some of those accommodations. Next slide, please. So next we're gonna talk about what are some of the common reasonable modifications or accommodations for students with diabetes. Um, you might, might include designating and training school employees to provide care, including bus drivers, 
uh, monitoring blood glucose levels and responding to BGs that are too low or too high, identifying which staff will help a student to administer insulin and administering insulin for a student who cannot do it independently, addressing carb counting, if the child needs help with this, who will help, uh, administering glucagon, is there a nurse at the school? If not, are school staff authorized to administer the medication? If yes, who will be trained to do this? Uh, communication with parents about schedule changes, classroom celebrations, and field trips. It's important to remember that providing equal access is not just about providing physical access to school or field trips or extracurricular activities. It's also about proactive communication so that parents and school teams can plan ahead so that a student with diabetes can fully participate in school activities. And as mentioned before, other accommodations may include allowing a student with diabetes to eat a regular, regularly scheduled snack um, during the day, carry testing supplies, or a CGM or smartphone, or eat or drink past acting carbs at any time needed to treat a low or high blood sugar. Next slide, please. In addition to the federal laws, there are also state and local laws and regulations that apply to students with diabetes. These include Board of Nursing regulations, such as Nurse Practices Acts, which vary state by state and dictate who may perform various aspects of diabetes care. Um, often though, there is no statewide policy and policy is determined district by district. Um, for example, um, my district had created a diabetes protocol, which is based on the ADA's model 504 plan. It was not intended to be a one size fits all plan by any means, but it provides a floor for basic accommodations that must be provided for students in the district with T1D. And then parents and school teams can individualize and add accommodations as needed in their uh, 504 plan or an IAP. And, uh, when my son was first diagnosed at the age at age three, and all of this was so new to me, I found that to be very helpful. Uh, some states have developed school diabetes management guidelines. Some states have passed school diabetes care legislation or changed board of nursing regulations relating to the administration of insulin or glucagon, or have regulations relating to administration of medication by child care centers. Uh, regardless of state and local laws, though, the requirements of the federal laws we discussed earlier must always be met and prevail over any conflicting state laws. To learn more about your state laws, please go to diabetes.org um, slash federal laws. Next slide, please. All right. Um, next, we want to mention that there was a lawsuit in New York last year that the ADA was a part of related to diabetes management in the school setting. This case directly benefits students in New York, but also serves as a model for schools nationwide. Uh, as we have background, a complaint was filed in November of 2018 with the U.S. Court for the Eastern District of New York, that's a federal court, um, by the ADA and three New York City public school families against the New York City Department of Education. Um, some of the challenges presented in that lawsuit involved timeliness of the 504 process, uh, inadequate training, and failure to accommodate students with diabetes on field trips and on school buses. Um, ultimately, a settlement agreement and court order, um, settlement agreement was reached, and a court order um, for final approval was entered on April 21st of 2023. Um, prior to that settlement agreement, um, there were some motions in the court had held that a failure to provide a nurse for nurse dependent T1D students on field trips and a trained adult to administer glucagon on school buses does constitute discrimination. Um, so ultimately, the settlement agreement required that a 504 process be put in place and that um, there be training for school nurses, staff, and bus drivers. Um, and that also care be provided uh, for field trips and extracurricular events. And it also established a three-year monitoring and reporting period to make sure all of these things happen. So again, this is a, is a New York case that um, only directly impacts um, those um, living and going to school in New York, but it really does serve as a model um, nationwide for that 504 process and training um, and how to provide care. Um, for our field trips and extracurricular activities and events. Uh, next slide, please.
So next we are going to go to our second case study and poll. This involves Keith, who is 11 years old. Keith uses a continuous glucose monitor, monitor to monitor his blood glucose levels. Uh, Keith's CGM alarms are set to alert Keith and his classroom teachers when he is too low or too high. Keith's teachers and school nurses are willing to be trained to recognize and help Keith respond to the alarms. The school district will not permit its employees to use CGM, even though state law permits non-clinical school staff to be trained to provide care. Keith has a DMMP, but does not have a 504 plan or IEP. Uh, does the school district's refusal constitute discrimination? And what might uh, Keith's parents' next steps be? I'll just give you a moment to answer. Just give it a couple more seconds. Looks like yeah. people are still responding. Responses are still coming in. <laughs> That's a good sign. Yeah. Okay, so 21 people have answered so far. 14 say yes, uh, three say no, and four say it depends. So often it does depend. <laughs> a lot of these situations are very fact specific and, you know, there's a lot of variables in, involved, but this, this might constitute discrimination under the ADA, especially if um, using the, the continuous glucose monitor is included in the DMMP. Um, we were actually talking just before this call about how there was a settlement agreement that was recently reached um, uh, with the Department of Justice um, in June of this year that supports the position that monitoring a CGM is a reasonable accommodation in the school setting. And in that case, it, um, the, the CGM use was outlined in the DMMP um, and uh, the parents were simply asking the school to respond um, to monitor the CGM and to respond. So in this situation, uh, what might these parents' next steps be? Can we see any of their answers? I, I can't see them, but are you able to see them, Jesse? I'm not able to see them, no. Okay. So, I mean, this, if, if where Keith has a DMMP, but he does not have a 504, this would be a good time to request a 504 meeting and seek to get a 504 in place that outlines um, the use of the CGM in accordance with the DMMP and determine who will monitor the CGM and who will respond, make sure all of those people are trained, um, if it's someone other than a school nurse. Um, next slide, please. Thanks, Andrea. You're welcome. So there are a number of key types of written plans that parents should be aware of and are addressed by the next slides. These written plans are essential to make sure the school meets the needs of your child in accordance with your provider's instructions and to make sure your child is treated fairly. Next slide, please. The first is the Diabetes Medical Management Plan, or DMMP. A simplified way to think about the DMMP is to think of it as the doctor's orders. The DMMP specifies what needs to be done to manage a particular student's diabetes. The DMMP is written by the healthcare team with input from the student and parent, and this document is signed by the healthcare provider. A 504 plan is a broader accommodations plan developed under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, a 504 accommodations plan documents reasonable accommodations needed to support academic progress and ensure equal opportunity. It is written by the 504 team, which includes the student, the family, school nurse, teachers, and administrators. 
An IEP or individualized education program is required for students who receive special education and related services under the Individuals with, Di with Disabilities Education Act. An IEP includes a section on health, but it is a comprehensive document that addresses all areas of a student's education and related services needs. It's written by the IEP team, which uh, includes general and special educators, related special service professionals, administrators, parents, and the student. Either a Section 504 plan or an IE IEP may include implementation details from the DMMP that either duplicates or replaces a separate IHP or individualized healthcare plan. Whatever plan is used, it's vitally important that, that the school health team makes the time to fully document the specifics of how the DMMP will be carried out in the school setting. The IHP documents, docu documents how the medical management as specified in the DMMP will be implemented across all school sponsored activities. It translates the DMMP into a plan that works in the context of a particular school building or program. That is, it identifies the by whom, when, where, and how the diabetes care tasks prescribed by the healthcare team will be carried out. The IHP is written by the school nurse, but it's developed with input from the school health team, including the student, family, school nurse, and other school staff. There are two quick reference plans provided in the ADA's school guide. These plans provide information on the recognition and treatment of hypo and hyperglycemia. Next slide, please. The American Diabetes Association provides a sample diabetes medical management plan that can be shared with your diabetes provider. Many states have their own version of this document, but no matter which plan your child uses, parents and providers should make sure all aspects of diabetes management in school, at, in school are addressed in accordance with the ADA's sample plan. Um, and this document and the Child Care DMMP are both available on ADA's website at diabetes.org slash childcare. Next slide, please. ADA, sorry, the DMMP is the individualized is individualized for your child by his or her diabetes by diabetes provider as the foundation for the development of your child's written accommodation plan. The DMMP is a comprehensive plan and includes information such as the level of supervision the student requires, medication doses how to manage hypo and hyperglycemia and ketone management. It may also include specific instructions for diabetes management during field trips and unplanned activities such as lockdowns and disasters. Diabetes management may be different with different levels of activity and different times of the day. Some of the main components of the DMMP include emergency contact information, blood glucose monitoring, glucagon administration, exercise and sports, recognition and treatment of hypo and hyperglycemia, insulin administration, the meal and snack schedule, and the level of self-care. Next slide, please. So what is a 504 plan? Parents should approach the development of their child's 504 plan proactively and collaboratively. That is, they should develop a plan even when things are going well. The staff or the situation at school could change rapidly Accommodations should be reasonable. It is safer for your child if all of it is in writing and everyone understands their role. A DMMP or healthcare plan is not a suitable, is not a substi suitable substitution for a Section 504 plan or other written accommodation plan. Next slide, please. Here are the benefits of having a 504 IEP or other written accommodation plan. It validates the health condition and what the student needs to function optimally. It helps the student better understand the accommodations that are available to them to help them focus on their education, such as unrestric unrestricted access to the health office or the restroom. These plans utilize a formal legal process for determining how needs will be met and addressing needs that are not being met. The written plan provides students and parents with the comfort in knowing that the student will be safe and treated fairly. The student and guardian can become better advocates by understanding the rights of the student with diabetes and what types of supports can be helpful to promote optimal learning, safety, and equal access. It is important for the school and family to work together to develop an individualized plan. What works for one student with diabetes may not work for your student, and what works for your student may not work for others. 
Next slide, please. Here are the initial steps for a parent who's beginning the 504 process. Parents should begin the 504 process by contacting the school's 504 and IEP coordinator. This is often the school principal, the school vice principal, a guidance counselor, or a teacher, or it could be someone else. Requests should be confirmed in writing. In fact, it's a good idea to keep a written log of all of your communications with the school when navigating through the 504 process. The school may initiate the process if the need for services or special education is suspected. School districts may require an indiv individual assessment to determine if a child is eligible for services under these laws. For example, a formal assessment is required for an IEP to determine if the child is eligible. With either plan, a team will be convened to discuss the student's eligibility. Once eligibility has been established, the team will convene to develop a written plan, a Section 504 plan or an IEP. The 504 and IEP are important pieces of the diabetes toolbox for all students with diabetes. Don't wait until there's a problem, and I can't stress that enough. You really want to have this in place before you need it. Next slide, please. Frequently asked questions about school. What steps should be taken if a student is encountering diabetes management issues at school? The school should be educated on the relevant laws and the school's legal obligations. If a conversation doesn't work, drafting a letter explaining the child's rights can be helpful. Can a school say they do not have anyone trained on diabetes management and therefore refuse to enroll a student or send a student to another school? No, the answer to that very simply is no. Training school staff in addition to a school nurse, in addition to a school nurse, to provide diabetes care enables a child to safely access the school setting. Parents can be helpful in connecting the school nurse with a pediatric diabetes health care provider to conduct trainings. Can a school refuse to allow a student with diabetes to go on a field trip if a parent or guardian does not come along? No, it is absolutely the school's legal obligation to provide a school nurse or trained non-clinical staff member to provide care to the student during a field trip. A parent cannot be required to accompany the student as a condition of the student's participation. And this also applies to um, other school activities like summer school or before and school care or before and after school care or activities. Next slide, please. Here's our third poll, our third case study. Test your federal law knowledge. Audrey, a high school sophomore, was diagnosed with type, type 1 diabetes over the summer break. Audrey is a straight A student and self-manages her diabetes. Audrey's parents have contacted the school principal to ask for a 504 team meeting. The school principal tells Audrey's parents she doesn't need a 504 plan because she has excellent grades. The school principal further explains that in order to qualify for a 504 service, or to qualify for 504 services, a student must be suffering academically. Is the school principal correct in refusing to convene the 504 team on this basis? Okay, I'm not seeing the poll pop up. I'm not sure. There it is. <laughs> Okay, so 30 out of 30, 30 people answered. One said yes, 29 said no. So is the school principal correct in refusing to convene the 504 team? The answer is he is not correct. Um, and I could have written this slide. This is exactly what happened whenever my daughter was diagnosed. She was diagnosed her sophomore year in high school and she was a very good student. Um, our, our administrators and teachers, nurses, counselors, they're fantastic. Um, I can't say enough about them, but they, when asked, you know, do we need a 504? And I, I didn't have, I didn't have the knowledge that I do now. Um, when I asked that question was, well, not really, but it's up to you. Um, I strongly, strongly recommend um, that you always have a written plan in place and can't say that enough. And I think this is a good good time to give a plug to our um, legal advocacy services. So if you are facing a, a situation where you're 
not sure how to request a 504 if you're facing other discrimination issues at school, um, please, please, I encourage you to contact our Center for Information by calling 1-800-DIABETES or ask ADA at diabetes.org. And um, while today's webinar is a kind of surface answers to problems that you may be having, if you contact our Center for Information when you're facing a discrimination matter, uh, we'll be able to send you resources that are that take a much deeper dive um, into whatever specific problem that you're facing. So um, yeah, I just wanted to give that a plug. And next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about resources. Um, as Jesse just touched on, the ADA has comprehensive Safe at School resources for free on its website, which we really encourage you to take a look at. Also, please feel free to share these resources with school administrators, staff, other parents, and healthcare providers. Remember, as a parent or caregiver, you are most influential. You are the, excuse me, I'm going to start coughing. Okay. Um, so the I apologize about that. That just came on very quickly. <laughs> um, but what I was going to say is remember as a parent or a caregiver, you are the most influential person for educating and training the school nurses and school staff about your child. Um, next slide, please. Now, we have a number of um, resources um, on the website. Uh, as you can see over on the right, there is a guide called ha Helping the Student with Diabetes Succeed at School. This guide provides an overview of diabetes, actions for school personnel, parents, and students, tools for effective diabetes management, and school responsibilities under federal laws. Uh, this uh, guide was updated by the ADA Safe at School Working Group in 2022 and includes a number of training modules, including one on diabetes basics, what key personnel need to know, and, and that's the one you see um, on the left there. Um, this training module includes topics such as what is diabetes, why care at school is required, uh, basic components of diabetes care at school, complications of diabetes, and hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. And also if you search around in that section of the website, there's there are lots of other modules um, there that can be very useful in the school setting. Next slide, please. So this is a card that the ADA created for students to print and carry with them in response to parents sharing that students were being stopped by school personnel for using smartphones. And this is right on the website and you can download it and print it and just put it in your child's backpack. Um, so that they can carry it with them if they want to. Um, I actually didn't know about this particular resource um, and um, I'm excited about it because my son who's now 11 is going to middle school next year and he's coming from elementary school where all of the teachers knew him from very start of kindergarten. Um, you know, they, they all knew that he had diabetes. He felt very safe there. Um, and now he's going to this new big school. And the first thing he said to me is, mommy, what if I get um, stopped in the hall and um, get in trouble for using my cell phone? Nobody knows I have diabetes. And so um, I'm really, I was excited to see this and it could be a great tool for kids to have on them um, in addition to, you know, using words to advocate for themselves in the school setting. Next slide, please. So next we have another case study. This case study involves Sarah, age 16. Sarah plays varsity basketball and self-manages her diabetes. Sarah's parents and school nurse want to make sure Sarah's coaches and athletic trainers understand diabetes and know how to recognize and treat a low. Uh, where would Sarah's parents find resources to share with her school nurse to help train coaches and athletic trainers? We'll give everyone a minute to respond.
Andrea, I'm not able to see the answers. I think I, I after words, I can see them, but okay. do you want to share? That's so okay. Yeah, so this, this is a situation where it would be great for Sarah's parents to refer to the American Diabetes Association's website. Um, specifically, the guide for helping students with diabetes succeed at school may have information that would be helpful to them. There is a section on extracurricular activities and on self-management um, in that guide. Um, so this, this is a great situation to refer to the website and see what's there that can, can help uh, the parents uh, educate the school staff on what is needed. Next slide, please. So um, next we're gonna just talk a little bit about um, education of, um, beyond high school, post-secondary education, such as college. Um, this is a guide that's also um, on the resources page of the American Diabetes Association's website. It's called Going to College with Diabetes. This guide covers a variety of topics, including the laws that protect students with diabetes at college, the admission process, what modifications or accommodations are available in the college setting, how to work with your college disability services officer to get accommodations, and also how disagreements are resolved. Next slide, please. So some key takeaways and tips. Um, you can use this back to school checklist. Um, first, make sure your child's DMMP is current and meet with school nurse to review and develop an implementation plan. Um, make sure the school has trained employees available to provide diabetes care and assistance to your child as required by the DMMP. Be a resource for the school and engage in conversations about needs and reasonable expectations work with the school to develop an individualized 504 plan, an IEP or other written accommodations plan for your child, provide current contact information and provide supplies, equipment and food for your child, um, including fast acting carbs, testing supplies and, and supplemental snacks um, if needed. Next slide, please. So in summary, the formula for a safe and healthy school year is planning, education, training, communication, and teamwork. Next slide, please. Um, and so we also just wanted to mention that there are going to be uh, some really great uh, virtual events that are coming up related to back to school in addition to the programming um, you attended tonight. The first one is school nurses panel discussion on the use of continuous glucose monitors at school. And this one is on August 13th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And then the next one is the rights of children with diabetes in the childcare setting on August 14th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And you can register for either of these events at diabetes.org um, slash safe at school. And that is the close of our presentation tonight. I think we have some time for questions. Yes, we do. Thank you. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, a student would only have an IEP or a 504, correct? Uh, my son has an IEP and the diabetes educator tells me he needs a 504 too. This doesn't sound right to me. So in most states, you only need one. There, there might be some states that, you know, state differently in their state laws, but um, most of the time you only would have an IEP or a 504. And uh, traditionally those accommodations that would be included in a 504 plan are incorporated into the IEP. There's an accommodation section of the IEP that it, they can be listed in, or as I mentioned, you can do a separate document and incorporate it by reference. And that's usually indicated in the additional information section of the IEP. And Marty, I see your question in the chat. I'd love to send you more information if you wanna contact the Center for Information. Um, and again, that's 1-800-DIABETES or ADA at diabetes.org. Um, I have more information I can send you about that. Is the school required to provide a nurse to go along on field trips? Yes, absolutely. So a field trip is a school-sponsored activity. Um, so the, a nurse or trained diabetes 
personnel needs to go and provide the di diabetes care on that field trip. Um, but if you're in a state where the um, nurses are prohibited from delegating uh, diabetes care tasks to staff, then the nurse must attend. I am being told I need to come to school to get insulin. Is this legal? That is not legal. Um, the school must provide either a nurse or non-trained or non-clinical staff member to provide that care to your student at school. Um, and of course that applies to public schools, private schools are a little bit different. So keep that in mind, but there should always be um, a nurse or trained non-clinical staff member to administer insulin and glucagon for your, for your child. Who do I contact at school to begin the 504 process? So th that might be school dependent. Um, each district and each school might have their own processes for it. Typically, you're going to reach out to the principal or the guidance counselor. Um, if you have a director of student services um, within your district, you could also reach out to them um, and, and start there and they can direct you to the right person. Um, a lot of districts do have um, handbooks on their websites that will outline the 504 procedures and, and may tell you who to contact, but it is generally a principal or a guidance counselor that handles that process. Uh, my child attends public school and does not have a 504 plan. Um, do modifications still need to be provided even though there's no written plan? Yes, the answer is yes. The school should should provide services. The 504 plan really um, defines what steps should be taken to meet the the doctor's orders of the DMMP. So it's a, a more tailored document, um, but there and it and it benefits you to have it. So if you don't have one, I, I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, but the school is always required to provide. Um, accommodations and, and care for your student with diabetes. Okay. What do I do if my school won't let my child participate in school sports because there is no one to provide diabetes care? Um, you should, well, if you have a, a 504 or an IEP, you could call a 504 meeting or an IEP meeting and talk about the situation, um, but that that's not okay, that they do not let your child participate. Your child has a right to participate in any school activity and school-sponsored activity, so if it is a, a school-based sport, um, then they have the right to participate. Um, you could educate them on the importance of having somebody there and um, also reach out to the American Diabetes Association's call center because there are a lot of um, cases and settlement agreements nationwide that support that, um, that they can't prevent their child from participating. They need to either provide a nurse or train diabetes staff to um, provide the diabetes care that's needed and that is outlined in the DMMP. The DMMP extends um, you know, beyond the school day, if it is a school sponsored uh, activity or event. My child attends a Catholic school. Is my child eligible for services uh, to help with her diabetes? It depends. Um, religious entities are generally exempt from the ADA, um, but uh, if they are receiving federal funds, then Section 504 might apply. So this is one of those situations that's really fact specific. You want to um, do a little bit of investigation on on the specifics of the school and um, what laws apply to it, and then um, you know, and then determine whether accommodations are needed. But like I had mentioned earlier, there are a lot of schools that you know do not you know, there might be religious entities and are exempt under some of these laws, but they still might be, they still are willing to provide these accommodations because at the end of the day, they want to, um, you know, what's in the best interest of the child. So um, even if you think that a law doesn't apply and you don't, you know, you don't have that behind you, it's always a great idea to open the conversation, talk about what your child's needs are, educate the, um, you know, the person in charge about it and just see what they're willing and able to do. 
If there is a written plan from the physician stating the student is independent with insulin administration, must the school still provide a nurse or non-clinical trained staff member to go on field trips? Yes. So while your student may be independent most of the time, there are still situations where they could become low and not able to take care of themselves in that situation. So uh, the answer is yes. They, there should always be someone um, around to be able to know what to do in those emergency situations and also to, also to administer glucagon. And then one last question, what training resources are available for school nurses to use to train school staff? And where can I find those resources? So on the ADA website, there are training modules that are available for nurses um, and they're, they're fantastic. Um, they are available, I think there's close to 20, somewhere around 20 of those modules available for school nurses to use um, in training situations. One thing I wanna add there too, is that it's really important for you as a parent to also provide information to the school nurse for them to use to train the staff or to see if you can participate in that training to some extent, because you're the expert on your child and you, you really know you know, what works for your child in any given situation. And it's important. And, and what, a, what a high blood sugar looks like, what a low blood sugar looks like for your child. And, and that information is invaluable to, um, to the school staff and can really help the nurse through that training process. We did get one more question. So I'll ask this one and this will be the last one before you wrap up. Can students self-administer if attending a vocational program in the morning and needs to eat on the bus when transported back to the high school for afternoon classes. So the student should be able to self-administer at any time, anywhere during the day, whatever is needed according to their needs. Um, so yes, they should be able to have access to food when they need it, their insulin to administer insulin and to test their blood sugar um, according to what they're, what they're experiencing at that time. Okay, did you wanna wrap up? Yeah, I'll just say thank you everyone for joining us. Um, just a reminder that this has been recorded. If you need to go back and refer to it, it'll be available on our website. Um, I'm starting to see back to school items in the store. So it's, it's upon us <laughs> for sure. So thank you so much. And thank you to Andrea and to Abby and Crystal for helping us um, pull this off. Yes, thank you everyone.